Ne, 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 Software 
about 19 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, when I went, first went to university, uh, we had a nice quick internet connection and other people didn't. So I, me and my friends downloaded CD sets and started selling them to our friends at school. Uh, so we made a little bit of money from that, which was, which was nice. Uh, Interestingly, my, my first distribution, I think, was Mantriva? That before Mandre? Yeah. Uh, and then eventually, uh, eventually I moved on to Debian, uh, where I was for many years. Uh, ended up being Debian release manager for my sins for about six years. Uh, I should point out all my releases came out every two years, so it wasn't my fault that it took five years for Debian to release. Uh, but then I was Debian project leader for a year as well. Um, but I've always been um, involved with distros across the board, uh, because my aim is to try and encourage free software, uh, and to try and ensure that people use freedoms. Object. So I want to try and look at uh, the sort of the the present day and, and, and where we are now. There has been a meteoric rise in free software. Uh, some say free software has won, in a way. The use of Linux is now widespread. It's in international business devices, it's in mobile computing, it's in servers. I believe a few months ago it was announced that the top 100 supercomputers in the world now all run Linux. I remember when I was Debian project leader, uh, a press release got um, released uh, about one of the Debian stable releases which came out. And it said, congratulations to Debian on your latest release. We're going to like bake cakes at Linux Fest Northwest. Everyone can have cakes on us. And that press release was from Microsoft. And this is the strange world we live in. <laughs> but it's interesting, it is not just using free software that people are now copying. As I mentioned before, we have this distributed way of working where no matter where you are, you contribute. And this strange coming together of people from all over the world to produce something better is also being copied by companies. This is Slack, the concept that where work happens. It's, to be honest for those who don't know it, it's a lot like IRC, but it's very pretty. And so lots of people end up using it. And a bit like previously, I mentioned that people don't quite get it, and don't, they're trying to copy what we do, but they don't fundamentally understand. There's a saying in Slack. So yes, Slack is all about where work happens. You can work any way you want in the world, except if you want to work for Slack, then you have to relocate to San Francisco. <laughs> So I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the concept of the desktop and GNU Linux. Nowadays, if everything is in the cloud, does it matter? What's the relevance to having a desktop Linux system? Does it matter when everything's a web browser? I think it does, and there's a few reasons I'll, I'll go into it. We see Linux everywhere now in automotive, so your car is likely going to end up running Linux. You've seen it in healthcare. I know there's systems where if you get plugged in for an ECG, so it goes and looks in your heart, it's running GK and Wayland in the back end. I know because I've worked on some of it. And even on your toaster, if you want to get some bread in the morning. I, I do have a friend who recently got a new washing machine um, to 
get their uh, to uh, clean their clothes and they were flipping through the manual and having a look at okay so that I is pre and so I have my detergent here and in the back there's a copy of the GPL because it has all free software inside and we're getting that everywhere. But again, going back to those user freedoms, does it matter if your toaster is running GTK? What user freedoms does that give? So a quick look at the future. I, I should point out that I'm terrible at predicting anything. I'm terrible at predicting the future. Uh, in 2010, when the iPad first came out, I thought, well, that's an oversized phone which can't make phone calls. No one's going to use tablets. They're terrible. And how I was. So I am terrible at predicting the future. So, the typical joke is, it is. I'll have an anti, uh, an anti uh, prediction here. We have heard that the desktop is dead. I disagree. There are so many use cases that the free software desktop still have that's going to be incredibly important and remains important. Has anyone around here, uh, has anyone around here used Windows 10? Some people have. Have you tried to use it without an internet connection? <laughs> so, so somebody at the front did shout out what worked. Very little. Very little. There is one thing that works without an internet connection with Windows 10. It's not paint, because that needs to save to OneDrive uh, that goes into the cloud. It is just about the photo viewer, and it mostly doesn't crash. The ability to use things offline and without internet connection is incredibly important. We have areas we can win here with encouraging free software. Things like accessibility, privacy, and user freedoms. And these should be freedoms for everyone. So one thing I'm particularly proud of in Go and one of the things we continue to push is we include accessibility by default. I don't think that just because someone's blind, they should be required to use proprietary software in order to access computing. This is something that we prioritize and we make sure happens. I don't think that you should have your access to computing restricted because you're not willing to give up your private data to a large corporation who, who are going to do who knows what with it. I don't think you should give up your access to computing if you can't afford or don't have access to a fast internet connection. These sort of things I think are incredibly important and show why ensuring free software on the desktop is important. And a bit of a cautionary tale here. There are larger issues at work than just are we going to have a Windows installed on something or are we going to have Linux installed on something. We've seen again and again in the last 10, 15 years a number of government initiatives to try and undermine people's freedoms, people's rights to control their own computing. I remember after a spate of terrorist attacks in the UK, the then Prime Minister, uh, well, the then Home Secretary, Theresa May, um, said she wanted to make encryption illegal not understanding that exactly what that would do to every car, every Internet of Things device, every phone. 
And it's not just governments, but it's any for-profit company. Does anyone know who this logo is? Cambridge Analytica. This is a company who mined user data and quite literally changed the outcome of the national election. I'm not talking about the US or the UK or the Brexit, but actually has partnered with, with governments who weren't going to win and then magically won. If we allow proprietary software, if we cannot see if what it is doing, if it doesn't protect your user freedoms, if we allow proprietary software, this sort of thing will come to pass. Just having a look at my time, put a quick, slight diversion there. Um, going back to the year of the Linux desktop, James Henry, head of the Linux Foundation, 2017 is officially the year of the Linux desktop. And he said this at the Open Source Summit. It was fantastic, so he gave a large keynote saying this. Unfortunately, he gave his keynote talking about how it's a year of an accessible on the MacBook Pro. <laughs> I have a challenge for everyone. Who here writes free software or uses free software tools to, to write software. Excellent, fantastic. Do you write it on a free software platform? Not everyone. If you're going to push for free software and you're going to use free software, and, and I know this is difficult because I try to set up a next development environment on a Mac and it is not that easy to actually run through a native system because you have to have containers and, uh, and you have to have VMs and you have to containerize everything so it just works well. I say try just running Linux on your desktop. Try this. It makes it easier. And if you are trying to produce free software and have people do this, then give yourselves that same freedom and allow yourself to do that. And sometimes it may not work as well. File bugs, they get fixed. This may take some time, but by doing that, we are all contributing and keeping that stance of making sure things are free. And we're not going to have all your telemetrics sent to Apple if you're using Mac OS, for example. Before it was mentioned, we don't know how many people are using SUSE or OpenSUSE, for example. I know in Debian, maybe we have even less way of knowing that because we run public mirror networks and so we can't just go look at the box and see who's not in. Who here thinks that Apple don't know exactly how many users they have? Who thinks that Apple don't know exactly what you're doing with your computing? Who knows, who thinks that Apple don't know which applications you're using, when you're using them, how much you use them, and why should we essentially be providing that to Apple and paying them to have it when we can be in control of our own computing? So, what now? I'm still filled with hope. When I look around this room and I see the number of people here, that this is something that matters to a lot of people, and people care, and are passionate about. I want to put that power back into the hand of the users, and to ensure that this community carries on. How many students here are in the room? How many people are just starting on that free software journey? There's a, some tentative hands going up, but yes, it's fantastic. What I say is, get involved. Simon's talk was particularly good with this. You can get involved, do something, get started. I absolutely agree that 
we are one generation away from our free software being dead. And what we need to do is we need to encourage people to come along. It's not just us older people who've been doing it in many, many years, because at some point, I don't want to be coding free software for the rest of my life. I'd kind of like to go and retire on a yacht or something somewhere. Not that that will happen with a free profit salary, but, uh, but that sort of thing. We need to be able to move on. And it does make you, you very employable as well. The tools of learning open source software and being able to do it means there is work out there. And a lot of the things we're doing though go beyond that. So a, a quick one, uh, if you want to get involved with GNOME, for example, go to gnome.org slash get involved. And I should point out this is not just program. We want translators, we want designers, we want people who are good at marketing. We want everyone, no matter what your skill set, is to get involved in something. And I would say, just GNOME as well, pick your favourite free software project. Pick GNOME, pick OpenSUSE, pick anything you want. Tell you what, pick KDE. Go work with KDE. Make KDE awesome. If we end up with like 80% of all worldwide computers running KDE, and I don't have a job anymore, Fantastic! <laughs> We've won! We've empowered you to freedom! This is great! So get involved. Help us to produce this future where it is not controlled by proprietary companies, not controlled by people who own your data. But we put that empowerment into the hands of you, into the hands of people who produce and use that free software. So in the future, when you have your self-driving car, that's running you around, and we know that the code is open, and it's been audited, and that people know what it's doing. We know that next time you're in a hospital, and you're linked up to a number of machines, we know that hardware and the software is audited, and you can see it. And we know that, yes, in the morning, when you wake up and your poster goes ping, yes, it will be running free software. So, thank you very much. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I welcome them. I welcome uh, them. Um, and just thank you, everyone, for coming along to this fantastic event and also uh, to the OpenCZ for inviting me. Yes, so, so next week in, in Dresic we have a GNO Major Summit. So if you want to hear this talk again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, to what degree of um, exchange goes on between the GNO project? and the KDE project, because um, if I were to have a perfect desktop, um, I must put the cards on the table, I'm a, a hardened KDE user, but there are some features, especially in terms of the network connectivity, yep. um, whereby, you know, really rocks, and I think um, um, there's great scope for some sort of intermarriage to go on there. So that already happens. We have the free desktop project, which is essentially the place where GNOME and KDE and XFCE and Cinnamon and Budgie get together, and we talk about common things. In November, the 12th to 16th, uh, in Barcelona, we have the Let's App Summit, which is a co-hosted event which GNOME and KDE together are coming together to create something. And we, 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 we come together to do that. And the aim of that event is to try and encourage the app ecosystem. So we have, um, we encourage people to write apps for Linux and create this thing across desktops. There's this thing that 
uses the description between KT and GNU, and that's viewed a lot more than the actual KDE or GNOME developers. We work close together, we know each other, we end up at the same conferences, we hang around at Foster. Um, the KDE people come along to the GNOME drinks event we have at Foster. We have a beer together. We do work together. Now, occasionally we have disagreements on how to introduce such use of freedoms and what we think is the best way of doing it, and that's fine. So there is, a, there is collaboration that does go on, uh, and we do sort of continue to do it. It is also free software. So KDI know contains a lot of GNOME you know, components, uh, so do many different things. It's, it is an area that we continue to work on um, together and, and to produce that. Sounds like there's no more questions, but I've still got five minutes left. Excellent. In that case, I'm going to talk about our coding education challenge for five minutes, because I can. Just give me a second, I'll try and find the slides. Let's go with this one. This is something I did at uh, Guadalajara, kind our of last course, at our last um, conference we came out together. Uh, do, do, do. The Coding Education Challenge. Ah, this one should be interesting for everyone here. At Guadalajara, I announced we received a half a million dollar donation from Endless support this coding education challenge. The aim of this is to teach people to code and to teach people to code open source software specifically. We want to increase the awareness of and the skills required for people to learn free software. And particularly to increase the number of people who are trained in coding free software. So it's not just teaching people to code, it's teaching people to code free software. And we want to increase the percentage of people for diverse communities involved with free software. These are our main three aims of the challenge. And we're not after necessarily people to just write software. What we want to do is work out the best way of teaching people to do that. We have a crowdsourced competition. We're after ideas. Ideas from anyone in the world who they think this would be a great way to teach people free software. We are going to have stages for this. So, in, I believe, hopefully January, we're opening up this competition, and they're going to ask anyone in the world for ideas on how to do this. How can we get people teaching? How can we get people to learn to code free software. The top 20 ideas will receive $6,500. Then we'll go on to develop those ideas a little bit more to try and create a prototype, something a proof of concept to show that their ideas actually have merit in their work. Of that, the top five receive $25,000. Then those top five ideas will use that to go and actually produce something that works. So that could be a series of lectures, in video series. It could be some software that teaches other people software. It could be anything. And the top prize of that will receive $100,000. And then $25,000 for the second prize. So this is actual real money. It can be individuals or it can be teams. So this is a way that, that the GNOME Foundation directly is trying to get more people into the software. This, the GNOME Foundation is something that is more than just the desktop. That's over here. We care passionately about the use of freedoms and, and allowing people to do things. So this is something new that, that we're doing. So carry on how you work at the GNOME website around January. 
and we'll be watching this and asking for ideas and there's real money available for the best ideas that we have out there for actually bring them on to teach people to get to that next generation of people to learn to code. And it's not just about teaching people, oh, they can code, and then they go and make the next Fortnite game. That doesn't empower use freedom. We want to show people how you can use free software, and you can contribute to that. This time around, uh, the next slide's very boring, so I'll leave you with that. Uh, and just say, I guess, uh, I think I've used a, a bit of time, so, Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah. Uh -huh. 